Introducing Director Tandon. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh my God, is this HBCU week or what? <laughs> Happy HBCU week. How are you all doing? Excellent, excellent. My name is Neera Tandon, and I am the chair of the Domestic Policy Council at the White House. In a few minutes, you're going to hear from my boss. But I have the great privilege of working on policies with the Department of Education around HBCUs. And, uh, and that is really why I'm here, because uh, of the president's commitment, the vice president's commitment to HBCUs, and ensuring that we're doing everything we can to support HBCUs, which we know are a cornerstone of our higher education system. And so, yes. So I want to particularly thank Dr. Dietra Trent, Executive Director of the White House Initiative on HBCUs. You're going to have to do that for everybody. <laughs> Doctors Tony Allen and Glenda Glover, who are co-chairs. Yes. I have the tremendous privilege of working with these incredible leaders who are ensuring that we do everything we can. They are good allies, but they also hold us accountable for ensuring that we're doing everything we can to support HBCUs. And I know the theme of this conference is, this week is raising the bar where, it, where excellence and opportunity meet. But I know that this year, I know that we should say loud and clear that for over 180 years, our country's HBCUs have been ensuring that we raise the bar through the roof. That's why the Biden-Harris administration has been supporting and empowering HBCU, HBCUs, and this is such a priority for us because HBCUs create opportunity and exude excellence. As I said, my boss and resident will talk a, a bit more about everything we've done. Um, and uh, I don't want to steal any of that thunder because it's a lot. So I'll just talk a little bit about the why of this work, why we have made HBCUs such a central pillar of our work on higher education. And that's because uh, we know that Essentially, having access to higher education is critical for the American dream, but that that success really shouldn't be just for the privilege. It's about ensuring that everyone, every single person, has real opportunity. It's a core principle for the president and the vice president. And I know a lot of people talk about the American dream, but this is why it's so crucial, because HBCUs, are the best engine of economic mobility in our country. They punch way above their weight, and the truth is that they create more economic mobility than the rest of the higher education system. Yes. Yes. And that's why when we invest in HBCUs, we are actually investing in true opportunity, real opportunity. And that's why it's, there's such a huge return on investment. And so that's why uh, we are so proud of, that, of this work. And it's really not just me saying it. The President's Council of Economic Advisors did an analysis recently that determined that HBCUs are, are ensuring this kind of opportunity. They found that nearly 30% of HBCU students rise at least two income levels from their parents by age 30, which is almost double the rest of higher education, okay? And we know that HBCU grads are often the first people in their, first people in their families to go to college, and that they, the HBCUs have been fundamental to not just creating the black middle class in our country, but also creating uh, a few, creating the leadership for our country. So that's why we are so proud of the investments we've made. And the president will talk more about this, as I said. But 
We've made historic investments in STEM research, bolstering R&D capacity, and fostering research efforts more broadly at HBCUs because we know that there is this chicken and egg problem, which is uh, historically HBCUs haven't received enough funding, and so, <laughs> Someone asked me to say it again, so I'll repeat. <laughs> they have not received enough funding, and that is why, and that is why sometimes they're disadvantaged with research grants and getting the funding that they need um, to really compete on an equal footing with the rest of higher education. So that's why we don't apologize for being intentional about ensuring that when we make investments in chips and science, when we make investments in renewable energy, when the Department of Defense is making investments, they are thinking intentionally about how they uh, invest in higher education, uh, in, in HBCUs. And I just need to give a particular shout out to Secretary Miguel Cardona at the Department of Education, who's right there, over there in the front row. Because the Department of Education and its research has really led the way across the administration to ensuring that we are thinking of HBCUs first when it comes to research dollars, not last. That is important as we build up the infrastructure of HBCUs. And as, as I said, one of the real reasons this is so critical is because it is important for opportunity. It is important for the leadership of our country because we know so many phenomenal leaders have come from the HBCUs. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, that there are many HBCU grads in the administration. And of course, uh, we are, they are painting a new picture of leadership led by the Vice President of the United States. So, It's because of the president's long commitment, the vice president's knowledge, but the president's intense commitment over decades that we are investing at more at the highest level ever. And I am grateful for the leaders in this room who've been tremendous partners to us in the White House. Thank you very much. Distinguished guests, please welcome HBCU scholar Veronica Redden. Hi, I am Veronica Redden, a senior attending the first HBCU, Cheney University of Pennsylvania. I have the honor of introducing for you all today, Dr. Tony Allen. Dr. Tony Allen is chief executive officer of the nation's most diverse contemporary HBCU, Delaware State University. A comprehensive research institution with a $150 million budget and a $27 million research portfolio, the 1890 Land Grant Institution is home to four academic colleges serving over 6,400 undergraduates, boasting graduate and adult programs across the state of Delaware and in 23 countries. Dr. Allen started his career as speechwriter for then United States Senator Joseph R. Biden Jr. In 2020, he was named Chief Executive Officer of the 59th Presidential Inaugural after having served on the advisory board of the President's Transition Team. In 2021, he was appointed to the President's Board of Advisors on Historically Black Colleges and Universities as Chair. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Tony Allen. Let's give it up for Veronica. This is my beautiful wife, Tara. And we wanted to just say a few words about a person who's like family for us. In a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the Corinthian church, First Corinthians 15.10 notes the power of God's grace. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. 
and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. Yet though I labored more abundantly than they all, this is my favorite part, yet not I, but God's grace. I've known Joe Biden for 30 years. I know his story. I know his accomplishments. I know his heart. But before this summer, what I did not know was his deep understanding of the power of God's grace. You see, most of us recognize grace as a simple display of self-sacrifice, a humble nod to an adoring admirer, a gesture of kindness to a stranger. We recognize grace as benevolence given freely. And if you look at Joe Biden's personal story, at the work of his public life, you'll recognize countless examples of grace. He does not demure in the face of adversity, has never believed that anyone is beneath him or beyond his capacity for listening, for learning, and for love. But he's not just an example of God's grace to others. Joe Biden is the quintessential example of what God's grace has done in his own life. Can I get an amen? amen. His life is marked by the faithful uplift of people, regardless of where they come from, what they look like, or who they love. His is a life that reflects his service to the black community, in particular, our historically black colleges and universities. Isn't it ironic to be in Pennsylvania where the first two HBCUs started and all of us have been serving for more than 187 years? That's why when I knew he and Vice President Harris took office, they would turn to HBCUs and together demonstrate the power of God's grace for a people and a set of institutions whose time has come. Everyone in this room understands that HBCUs have always outperformed other institutions by doing more with less. But President Biden knows less is no longer acceptable. Everyone in this room understands that if you did not have HBCUs in communities throughout this country, they would have to emerge for our country to survive. And everyone in this room should know, should understand, that no other administration in the history of the republic, let me say that again, no other administration in the history of the republic has done more for historically black colleges and universities than that of President Joe Biden. You might not know this, but he started his first Senate campaign on the hallowed grounds of Delaware State University in 1972, and is leaving with an unmatched presidency and historic investment in HBCUs. But perhaps even more important is Biden's administration and the record number of senior administrative executives from HBCUs, more than any other president in American history. And if you would allow me to be so bold, that includes the person I believe that will be the next President of the United States. Can I talk about it for a little bit? Howard University graduate. Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated member. Prosecutor, Senator, wife, cook, and bonus mom of the highest order, the Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. But let me be clear on this one point, and some of these students might know this, Joe Biden's been standing on business throughout his career. Standing on big business. And let me tell you how that standing on business has changed the face of American politics. Brothers and sisters, you might be reminded when President Obama needed a running mate who reflected his values and could show up in every moment that mattered, he chose Joe Biden. Twice. When the great Jim Clyburn, a distinguished alum of South Carolina State University, spoke up from his beloved South Carolina in February 2020 and asked us to consider his choice 
for President of the United States. He simply said, we know Joe Biden, and Joe Biden knows us. And when Joe Biden secured the Democratic nomination for the president, he chose Kamala Harris, the first black woman to serve in that role. But check this out. When he decided to put country over all else, he stopped all the hand-wringing and emphatically pointed to Vice President Harris as our leader into the next generation of American greatness. My friends, some historians will say Joe Biden's tenure as president will be looked upon as one of the most consequential of our time. They're right. Others will say no moment will rival the one in late July when he moved with Herculean grace. They're right, too. Joe Biden is love of country. He's love of the possibilities found in America, whose best days are forever in front of her. And our community has borne witness. We recognize and testify to his grace. Yet do I labor more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but God's grace. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, my fellow Americans, the 46th president of these United States, Joseph R. Biden. Thank you. Please, please have a seat. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, look, I love Kamala. Thank you all. As the saying goes, you all brung me to the dance. <laughs> Folks, I want to get something straight at the outset. I love Kamala. But Delaware State's the best HBCU in America. <laughs> They're the ones that you know what? you think I'm kidding. I was a 29-year-old kid, and they embraced me. They embraced me like you can't imagine. And we won the second youngest person in American history because of uh, HBCU called Delaware State. And by the way, I hired a young man from Delaware State named Tony Allen. Came to work for me. While there, I encouraged him to continue to get his extend his degree. He got his doctorate and left. He became president himself. <laughs> I don't know how the hell that happened so quick. But Tony, thank you, man. I've been introduced countless times, but never quite like that. And I mean it, Tony, from the bottom of my heart, I'm deeply moved. By God's grace, we're true friends, and Delaware State will always have a special place in my heart, for real. And to the presidents and administrators of our 101 historic black colleges and universities, it's an honor to celebrate, and I mean celebrate, HBCU Week with you. Before I begin, I want to make a quick reference. Uh, the attempted assassination against our former president of Florida yesterday. I commend the Secret Service for the expert handling of the situation. And the former president is protected from harm and subject is and is the subject is in custody. An acting head of the Secret Service is in Florida today assessing what happened and determining whether any further adjustments need to be made to ensure the safety of our former president. Let me just say. There is no, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, those of you who know me, many of you do, no place in political violence for political violence in America. None. Zero. Never. I've always condemned political violence. I always will in America. In America, we resolve our difference peacefully at the ballot box, not at the end of a gun. America suffered too many times the tragedy of an assassin's bullet. It solves nothing and just tears the country apart. We must do everything we can to prevent it and never give it any oxygen. Folks, now today's event, 
It's an honor to recognize HBCU excellence in our nation. I see excellence in it every single day. I see this weekend the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. I tell you what, the Foundation Gala, only about 3,500 people there. And I was happy, and I've been wanting to do this to celebrate the first ever White House brunch to celebrate black excellence. Black excellence. Which many of you and your alumni attended. It's about time to point out what's already been done. I'm proud to have the most diverse administration in history. It taps into the full I mean it. I made a commitment my administration is going to look like America. It taps into the full talents of our nation, including graduates of HBCUs like our amazing Vice President is. Folks, together, Kamala and I know that an education makes a person free. HBCU's education makes you fearless as well. It matters. I mean it. More than 180 years, born under the shadow of slavery and Jim Crow, HBCUs have instilled a sense of purpose and freedom, a commitment to make a difference for all their students, to lift up not just yourselves, but others along the way. Institution grounded in the belief that every American of every race and every background, every zip code, and you know me, I mean this, should have a fair and equal chance to go as far as their God-given talents can take them. That's who we are. That's what we stand for. But as I've said before, we place an inflection point in history. It comes along every six or seven generations. One of those rare moments in our history when the decisions, when the decisions we make now, right now, are going to determine the fate of our nation and the world for the next decades, for six, seven decades to come, and I mean it. When I wasn't going to run for president again after my son died coming back from Iraq, I decided that uh, I was going to write another book. I was going to write a book about the inflection points in world history, how it changed history, going all the way back to dealing with the printing press and how it's changed everything. But look, we're still in the battle. We're still in the battle for the very soul of America. In 2020, I ran, and I give you my word, this was the reason. I ran to redeem the soul of America, and restore decency and dignity to the office of the presidency. I ran to rebuild and expand the backbone of America, the middle class. And I ran to unite the country, remind ourselves that we can do anything we want to do when we do it together. Four years later, we made incredible progress because Kamala and I kept our commitment to you to ensure that all our students and all of our colleges and universities should be able to succeed. That's why I signed an executive order reestablishing the White House initiative of an HBCUs after my predecessor allowed it to lapse. Thank you, Dr. Trent, for leading it. I can't see you out there, but I'm sure you're there. And thank you, Tony and Dr. Glover, for leading my presidential board on HBCU. I'm also proud to lead the first administration in history to have a working group from the Divine Nine in the White House. Oh, I, I got it, man. I may, may be a white boy, but I ain't stupid. I figured out real quick. And by the way, there's an official group in the White House. Together, we get to work, we got to work right away with our signature investment in addressing one of the most pressing issues for HBCUs. We all know, and I mean this sincerely, that HBO, HBCU students are just as capable as any other students. No, but, but HBCUs don't have the endowments, like many other colleges and universities, that are able to fund research labs, improve campus infrastructure, and so much more. That's why I'm proud to be delivering on a record $17 billion. $17 billion for HBCUs, the most ever any administration has ever, 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 ever committed. Stay where you were. We've already distributed well over a billion. Folks, look, 
I want to make something clear at the outset. If you notice, the spending we've done, I have to the hold back there, the spending we've done has not fundamentally increased the deficit like that other guy did. It, no, no, seriously. It grows the economy. The more educated, how can we lead the world without being the most educated nation in the world? How can we lead the world without reaching out to the young people of this country to improve their capacity? You know, it's helped everything from HBCUs to do everything from providing financial aid by Pell Grants to building new housing and research labs. Prepare black students for jobs and industries of the future in high demand fields like cybersecurity, engineering, biochemistry, healthcare, and so much more. But that's not all. Together, we spearheaded one of the most equitable economic recoveries in history. How, as I said, how can we be the strongest economy in the world and lead the world without the best education system, without it taps into the talents of every student? Our, I mean, every student. In fact, my Council on Economic Advisors issued a report this spring on the economic power of HBCUs. Here's what they found. They found HBUs, HBCUs are engines of economic mobility in our country, raising the standard of living for everybody, for real. Despite representing only 3% of the college and universities in America, HBCUs are responsible for 40% of all black engineers, 50% of all black teachers, 70% of all doctors and dentists, and 80% of all black judges, and I'm increasing that number, too. But that's not all. My Chips and Science Act, which I was committed to, finally got it done. We ensure we create more hubs of innovation at HBCUs, create pathways to develop more researchers, and grow a diverse semiconductor workforce here at home. For example, I was in New York where I announced a significant chips investment in, with Micron, a leading semiconductor company that paired it and partnered with Norfolk State University to build a 6,000-square-foot high-tech facility for students and other researchers. My National Science Foundation just awarded $2 million to Clark Atlanta University to support their work in the HBCU chips network, fueling semiconductor research and development, and a workforce capacity at HBCUs. This is in addition to last week's announcement of $10.5 million for National Science Foundation grants to facilitate STEM research at more than a dozen HBCUs, including Central State University, a project to build a semiconductor R&D capacity. I'm also excited to announce that four HBCUs, Fort Valley State University, Russ College, Savannah State University, and Shaw University, they're receiving additional critical funding to boost their STEM programs, prepare their students for these incredible opportunities. And moving forward, I've encouraged semiconductor companies to continue to create and expand partnerships with HBCUs as they invest in American manufacturing. And Vice President Harris and the National Space Council she leads are ensuring the federal government, industry partner, and HBUs collaborate in opportunities for space-related technology and innovation, the future. And folks, my Office of Science and Technology Policy is developing and sharing the best approaches across the entire government, how to expand STEM research and investments in HBCUs. In addition, my administration continues to diversify the federal workforce, starting by opening doors of opportunity, like the HBCU Scholar Program that celebrates its 10th anniversary. I want to congratulate the 2024 cohorts of scholars, the largest cohort, all of whom are with us. Stand up if you're here. All right. If I'm still around, one of you are president, make sure you don't say who Joe who, okay? <laughs> we also know that black studies show black students who have black teachers are significantly more likely to graduate 
from high school. And enroll, we've known this for a long time, enroll in college. That's why my Department of Education has provided $450 million to ensure the teachers in our schools reflect diversity in our community. These small things matter a lot. For example, this funding has gone toward the Augustus F. Hawkins program, which is preparing the next generation of teachers at HBCUs. We're the first administration to secure funding for this program, providing almost $40 million to date. And today, I'm proud to announce four more HBCUs, Grambling State University, Morehouse College. Oh, I'm so tired of hearing about Morehouse, man. I did the commencement of Morehouse. One graduate came up to me, Mr. President, you're not a Morehouse man. The closest I get was doing a, doing a commencement. <laughs> North Carolina Central University and Prairie View A&M University. They're being awarded new grants to increase, te to increase teacher diversity. We know that while a college degree is still a ticket to the middle class, that ticket is becoming too expensive. That's why we've increased the maximum Pell Grant by $900 a year, the largest increase in a decade. It matters because HBCUs have twice the percentage of Pell Grant students as non-HBCUs. And my administration also relieved the debt of 5 million Americans, including a significant number of black borrowers. That means you can now start a business. You can buy a home, save for your children's school, give back to your community. And it grows the economy for everybody. It's not the cost, it grows the economy. There's so much more we're doing to help more HBU, HBCU students walk into a life of generational wealth and to be providers for their families, leaders of the communities, dreamers and doers of the nation. In fact, in just four years, working with HBCU leaders, we're making the most significant investment in black America ever in American history. Well, look, we have to be honest about the forces we face. We gather together in a year when we commemorate two of our nation's most historic achievements. The 70th anniversary of Brown versus the Board of Education that segregated our public schools, laid the groundwork for the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and allowed law discrimination in employment in a public place in which we've just observed its 60th anniversary. Instrumental in both achievements was Thurgood Marshall, an alum of Lincoln University, and Howard Law School. By the way, Lincoln's closer to Wilmington than it is to Philly. I've <laughs> been there many times. And generations of HBU educators and students come who came before. It opens the doors of hope and opportunity for a generation of black Americans and for the entire United States of America. It really does. But today, affirmative action in the values of diversity, equity, and inclusion are under attack like not long since I started as a young civil rights guy. Books are being banned. History is being erased. HBCUs, HBCUs have received bomb threats. And right now, lies and hate are being spread about Haitian, Ameri ha 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 Haitian Americans in Ohio. It's wrong. It's simply wrong. And it must stop. There are those who want a country for some of us, but not for all of us. But I've always believed that the promise of America, and I mean it sincerely, is big enough for everyone to succeed. Well, I really mean it, everyone. And there's been no more important voice for that truth than the black community and our HBCUs. That's what I see in your students, future doctors and researchers, curing cancer, artists shaping our culture, fearless journalists and intellectuals challenging convention, preachers and advocates inspiring us all. You prove the black history is American history. It is American history. And black excellence is American excellence.
Well, let me tell you something. If I show up on your campus, you better be nice to me. <laughs> Look, let me close with this. Mary McLeod Bethune was the, high, was the highest ranking black woman in Franklin Delano Roosevelt's administration. A pioneering educator, activist. She founded the proud HBCU Bethune Cookman University. Here's what she said. She said, the freedom gates are half ajar. We must pry them fully open. That's what I'm trying to do. Pry them fully open. For over 180 years, HBUs have been prying open freedom's gates. For the past four years, Kamala and I, with the help of all you and great leaders out there in the city that I serve with in the, the Congress and the Senate, are pushing right alongside them. And God willing, as HBCU graduate, the future President of the United States is going to soon be sitting behind the Resolute Desk, pushing the gates of freedom open once and for all. <laughs> Folks, you've probably heard me say this before. We just have to remember who the hell we are. No, I mean it. We're the United States of America. There is nothing beyond our capacity when we act together. Nothing, nothing, nothing. We're the only nation in history that's come out of every crisis stronger than we went in. That's because of you, because of all of us. We're a diverse nation. Therein lies our strength when we unite. So God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hush not so and don't cry. Every time I'd walk out of my grandfather fitting his home up in his grand Pennsylvania, he'd tell, Joey, keep the faith. And my grandmother would tell, no, Joey, spread it. Go spread the faith. Your folks might understand you by and by. Just move on up toward your destination. Though you may be